push that rock here with Simpson Matt discussing exponent rules. Here's one of the exponent rules that when the bases are the same, you can add the exponents. Now this proof that I'm about to do uh, depends on the whole number definition of ex uh, exponentiation. So n and p are gonna be whole numbers for now. We will learn that these properties apply to any real number. So uh, n and p can be any real number and the property will apply. But this proof only proves that it works when n and p are whole numbers. So I'm gonna write down the left-hand side of the equation. And I'm gonna to try to get, by doing things that are legal, get to this right-hand side. And if I can successfully get there doing legal things, then it's I've proven the statement. And the first thing I'm gonna do is rewrite this as b times b times, and keep going until I get to the last b. And how many b's are there? Well, there's n copies of it. And then I'm gonna multiply this the same way. How many b's would I have? Well, I would have p of them. And that is by definition. That's what it means to have b to the n. It means multiply b by itself n times. And b to the p, b times itself p times. So this is the definition of exponentiation. Now I'm gonna use the associative property of multiplication. The associative property says I can group it any way I want. So I can group it like so. And I have b times b, and I keep on multiplying out b's until I get to the last b. This, These three dots are the ellipsis, and uh, these are multiplying, meaning I keep multiplying b's until I get to the last one. Now, how many of them are there? Well, there's these n, and then there are those p's of them. So there's n plus p of them. Now, by definition, if I am multiplying n plus p b's together, then I have b to the n plus p, and voila, that's what I was trying to get. That's the right-hand side, and so my proof is complete. So I've proven this property for whole number bases. Here's another one, uh, and I show a proof of this in one of the activities that we're gonna do this week, but I just wanna verify it. Notice if I multiply, if I start off with this statement, b to the n is equal to b to the n minus p times b to the p. Okay, well, if I use the property we just proved on the last page, this side, this side here would be b to the n minus p plus p because if the bases are the same, you can add the exponents. So I could add those exponents and those will go away. And sure enough, I have b to the n equals b to the n. But remember that um, this multiplication came from this division here. This isn't really a proof because I relied on this equation, uh, which is what I'm trying to prove, but I have a proof in the activities this week. Now, I don't necessarily, I'll, I'm gonna have you in the activities walk through some of these proofs, but I, what I really want you to form the habit of is coming up with examples. Like here's a property. Just come up with an example and think about it in your mind's eye, why it works. Why can I multiply n times p here? If I'm raising a base to a power and then I raise to another power, why is it the powers multiply? So let's say I had two squared and it was cubed. Well, that means I have two twos, because this, this two means multiply this two by itself, like so, but I have three of those. So, how many twos do I have? Well, I have six, excuse me, six. Two times three is six. It's because I have three groups of two. That's the very definition of multiplication. Three groups of two objects is three times two. So that's why you can multiply. Now that's not a proof, that's just an example of why it works. So here's the one I just verified on the previous page. Let's do an example why it works. Let's say I had two to the five, over two to the three. That means I have two times two times two times two times two. I have five twos multiplied together over three twos multiplied together. Well, obviously these three twos will cancel those three twos. So I'm taking away from the five, the three that are down here and left with two of them. Two times two is two squared. So five minus three is this two. 
So it just makes sense. Okay, so if you come up with these examples, it will make sense in your mind, and then uh, this won't be a mystery to you. So here's an example. What if I have 2 times 3? Notice I have two bases, a times b, but they're raised to, say, the third power. Well, that means I have 2 times 3, and I have three sets of those. Well, the associative property and the commutative property says I can group this any way I want and rearrange it in any order I want. So I can make it 2 times 2 times 2, and I can make it 3 times 3 times 3. And so sure enough, I have 2 to the 3 times 3 to the 3, and that's what the property says, that if you have a, b to the n, well, then it's a to the n, b to the n. That doesn't work if there's a plus here. Does not work if there's a plus here. Too frequently in this class, you guys, when there's a plus here, apply the n to both of them. That doesn't work. It's when this is times. When you have a times b to the n, then this works. Let's try this one. What if I had, you know, 4 to the 3 over, oh wait, no, I'm supposed to have 4 fifths to the 3. Put the 3 out here. That's the case. I have different bases and I have an exponent. Make that 3. Well, that means I have 4 fifths times itself 3 times. Well, how do you multiply fractions? You go 4 times 4 times 4. So I have 4 cubed. And 5 times 5 times 5, 5 cubed. So, of course, the n applies to both the numerator and the denominator. So, anyway, try to form this habit of thinking of an example to verify whether or not you can do it. So, like, here's some examples of b to the 0 is 1. So, if I have, using our previous rule, uh, remember our rule when we subtracted this one right here? If you have like bases and you're dividing, you can take n minus p. So here I can go negative 2 is the like base, and I can go 3 minus 3, and I get negative 2 to the 0. But wait a minute. Isn't negative 2 cubed divided into itself? Isn't that 1? So this should be 1. And that's why any non-zero number to the 0 power is 1. I don't know why I have this written twice. Oh, I guess just to show you that if I went negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, well, that would give me positive 4 times negative 2 is a negative 8. And meanwhile, I get the same thing down here. It's supposed to be a negative, negative 8, and of course, that's positive 1. So yes, of course, it works. So what about this property that b to a negative power suddenly becomes 1 over b? Why does it go down in the denominator? Well, again, let's use that rule that we verified earlier, that if you have like bases and you're dividing, you subtract. So I go 3 minus 6. So I get 5 to the 3 minus 6, which is equal to 5 to the negative 3. And according to the rule, that should be 1 over 5 to the third. But why is that? Well, think about it. I have 5 times 5 times 5 over 5 times 5 times 5. Uh, see, 6 of them. There's 4, 5, 6. Okay? Oh, well, these three fives cancel with those three fives, and it leaves me 1 over 5 times 5 times 5, which, of course, is 1 over 5 to the 3. So, of course, this should be 1 over 5 to the 3. And so the rule of subtraction works, but when it gives you 0, when the subtraction rule gives you 0, it needs to be 1 for it to continue to work, to be consistent. And for it to be consistent when the top is smaller than the bottom, we need negative exponents to mean this. And so that's what they mean. Okay. So what about this guy? B to the 1 over n. Well, I'm going to raise it to the nth power and see what I get. That means that B 1 over n uh, times itself n times. Okay? So, I've got 1 over n, to b to the 1 over n times itself, and there's n of them. Now, they're all the like bases, so I can add them all up. So, b to the 1 over n plus 1 over n plus on and on and on until 1 over n, but how many of these are there? There's n of them. So, when I add them up, I get b to the n over n, which is just b to the 1, or b. So in other words, it takes n of them multiplied together to give me b. 
That's the very definition of the nth root. So this must equal the nth root of b. Okay, and an example is, uh, say, uh, 25 to the 1 half. That would be the square root of 25. Or say we want 6 to the 1 third. That would be the cubed root of 6. Okay, so when you have this fraction, the denominator is simply the root. What about if you have uh, another number other than 1 in the numerator? Well, then that just means that you have the nth root of b to the p power, which can also be written this way. Okay, so an example of that would be uh, we have the square root of 64 raised to the third power. The square root of 64 is 8, and we cube um, 8. That means we have 8 times 8 times 8, whatever that is. 8 times 8 is 64, and 64 times 8. Oh, this is terribly embarrassing that I don't know this. Um, but 8 times 6 is 48, and so it's 512. Oh, yeah, golly, this is 2 to the third raised to the third, so it's 2 to the ninth, 512. Okay, anyway, so... When, they have, when there's another power up here. Now, why does that work? Well, for the properties we had before, we have b to the 1 over n, and if we raise it to the p, well, one of our properties says if you raise a, a base to a power to another power, you multiply the power. So I have 1 over n times p, which is the same thing as p over n. Now, why does the order, why can the order n be interchangeable? Why can I put the p inside or outside? Well, because this order can be changed. Multiplication is commutative, so I can change it to this. Aha, and that's why you can switch the order up. So those are the exponent rules, and we need to be familiar with them. And right now we're just using them where n and p are whole numbers, but they do, well, we're starting to get fractions involved now here, um, but they do apply when this number is irrational, and that's what we're building up to. Math made simple. It's some math.